Welcome back for another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement. I'm here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. With Canada's economic indicators showing both strengths and weaknesses, it is a good time to check in with our regular guest, Thomas Gal Caldwell. Uh, Mr. Caldwell is the chairman and CEO of Caldwell Securities, and he joins us now from Toronto. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Tony. I guess my first question is, it's been about a month since our last discussion, so how do you see Canada's economic prospects? Uh, how do they look to you this month, Tom? Well, there hasn't been much change. As I think I've mentioned to you before, I am an incurable optimist. The, the numbers that we're getting out, you really can't put a great deal of credence in them. We're coming off a, a, a horrendous shock to the economy and to our society uh, over the last year. So there's been all this bouncing around and as sectors and people recover, I noticed today I wandered down King Street to get a hot dog and there were a whole bunch of people there. Not There haven't been that many people before, so people are returning. So the numbers, numbers are always lagging indicators. Unemployment numbers, all of this stuff are lagging. Um, we're, we're seeing, we have seen some significant inflation in a few sectors. For example, energy prices, uh, you know, we've, we've cut off funding that industry and and guess what, kids? You know, energy prices are now go through the roof. I think gasoline, uh, uh, you know, regular went from about eighty cents a liter to give or take a dollar fifty a liter in that period of time. Mind you, that doesn't show up in the government numbers because, uh, as you know, inflation doesn't really take into account right. energy, food, or housing, uh, or if you own a house, kind of thing. So, if you don't have to stay warm or eat or travel, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> now, uh, I guess. From my perspective, there's a, you're quite right. There's a lot of volatility, volatility out there and the number of different indicators going in different directions. So uh, how, uh, first of all, how is the market responding to that? And secondly, uh, you know, should investors be concerned? Well, just remember, for the longer-term investor, bad news is good news. Uh, and particularly the bad news of, oh, we might have this variant coming, the, the Delta variant, et cetera. And that pushed the market down a few days ago. Right. Uh, but the, the good news about that is it's, it's telling central banks, particularly the Fed, uh, but also the Bank of Canada, that we can't raise interest rates soon. And that's good news for equity markets. Remember, this whole equity boom that we've experienced has been fueled by very, very low interest rates. And according to the inflation in, in housing prices and everything else. So, Bad news kind of puts them on notice of, well, we can't tighten too soon. Let's leave interest rates lower. And as long as we do, I think you're still going to see fairly buoyant uh, prices for ownership, whether they be equities or, or houses or whatever else. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, the impact of, uh, on the markets of the, uh, I guess, the news that the Delta variant was spreading uh, in, in, in the United States at quite a clip. Um, is the market kind of discounting that now? Or, uh, I mean, we're going to have all these, I, I, I'm assuming, future scares of new variants uh, coming into the picture. So uh, it's hard to understand how one uh, assesses risk in that situation. Well, the, the interesting thing, uh, two days ago, the market had a very significant downdraft on the premise that the Delta variant could lead to further shutdowns. Uh, but that quickly corrected again. And, and you have to remember that whenever bad news happens in the markets, or even good news, it's amplified in markets. There are short-term traders or exchange-traded funds that add to volatility. And as I say, if you're a long-term investor, uh, short-term decli declines are buying opportunities. The, the, the feeling is, and again, I, I always get a kick of this, we've learned one thing, uh, over the last period of time with the phrase medical experts or health experts are no longer relevant. There are no experts in the middle. Everybody gives you their opinion. Um, and one is as bad as the other. But it, it seems to me, and what I've been hearing, I was laughing the other day, I was saying to somebody that I, I have the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, but you know that's the one that was really being bad mouthed by Americans, particularly because it wasn't American. Um, but it seems to be the one, again, to the rumor mill. It says not any expert opinions, that it might be the most effective against the Delta variant. Right. So everybody's running from vaccine to vaccine. But suffice to say, the variant is impacting the community in great measure, should I say, that has not been vaccinated. 
if you've been vaccinated, you're probably in pretty good order. You might get sick, but you're not going to die from it particularly. That's typically the prevailing, quote, wisdom, unquote. We're going to take a short break and we will be right back with Thomas Caldwell. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, at the News Forum with Thomas Caldwell. He's the chairman and CEO of Caldwell Securities. Tom, uh, you were mentioning before the break uh, inflation, uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, movement upwards, but uh, this volatility is keeping interest rates uh, level for the time being. Is this uh, a trend that you're watching very closely, or, or are you concerned about anything in that picture? I think the $64 question these days it relates to inflation either being a temporary post-COVID phenomenon or baked in as a longer term influence. And I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that. I'm inclined to suspect that the short term push up in, in, in prices is just that, just short term, and it will ease off. Whether we come back to a 2% inflation rate is another matter. I don't think we're going to do that. But suffice to say that combination, whether it's short or longer term, I think interest rates will stay low at least for another year. Uh, and uh, you're expecting, obviously, the Federal Reserve in the United States and uh, the Bank of Canada here in Canada, uh, they're staying put for now until they, they read the tea leaves. Is that right? I think so. I mean... Basically, you, everybody watches with great interest any musings out of central banks, but it's a little bit like watching paint dry. It's the same old, same old for the time being. I, I don't see anything dramatic. And every time they say something that has a market effect, they reverse it the next day. Oh, no, what I meant was something. Right. So I don't see much change. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go to a couple of uh, items uh, that I've gleaned from uh, media reports, and I'd love to get your reaction to them. First of all, there's been some news coverage recently that uh, millennials and uh, Generation Zers are resigning from job postings, and uh, they're 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 seemingly not fitting in as things move back to work uh, rather than work from home. Uh, there are that that uh, th those age cohorts are not not signing on to that. Uh, first of all, have you noticed that? And secondly. What's your kind of reaction to that reaction, I guess? We haven't seen it totally. And first off, I can never figure out what Generation X and Millennials are. Yeah. I keep using the phrase baby boom, and everybody just tells me that I'm, I'm old, which is fact true. Um, but I think there is going to be a reticence to coming back to offices by some people. But something I've noticed, even in our own firm, you can maintain a firm, you can maintain a business at a certain level, through absentee work, depending on what the job is. But you cannot build a firm that way. I find that uh, just even in the last couple of days, I mean, sitting down talking with the partners, um, here in the Brendan, Liz, other guys, you bounce ideas around. We've come up with some positive ideas, some positive initiatives, and we're doing it. And the, and the folks at home, they're not part of that. Uh, so from the employer point of view, uh, they're excluding themselves from the real game at hand. Uh, and, and that's something they should be very careful of because some aren't going to be given the choice uh, to return. I can also understand it from an employee's point of view. You're at home, uh, you're comfortable, you haven't been working for a long time. It's hard to get back in the grind. And particularly in Toronto, you know, driving in Toronto is now a nightmare with uh, Mr. Tory's bike lanes and all this nonsense. It's everything is hard. So yeah. I can understand wanting to stay at, at home. So it's, it really depends on the, but the folks who've come back into the office uh, of, of varying ages um, seem to be quite happy to be with people, to have you know, exchanges with people. And I think that's important uh, for all of us, but some are gonna make that decision to stay home. We haven't seen it as a discernible trend. I've seen it with a couple of our folks, uh, but, but uh, I think it's going to be a factor. Some people are gonna say, I wanna do this, but on the other hand, you know, you're at home and your wife has a couple of chores for you to do and you gotta get the car gas, and can you watch the kids for a minute? Uh, don't kid yourself. You can't do your job. And you're not part of uh, building something or bouncing ideas. You, you can't do it on the internet. So it's, it's, there's a lot of cross currents. But I think essentially you're going to be right. 
that those two groups, whoever they may be, are, are going to find themselves saying, well, maybe I like walking the dog for the day and doing a little bit. And that's fine, but they're going to ice themselves into clerical basic function roles, which can be done, but they can be done at home, by the way. Employers can have them done in India at a quarter of the price. So that's something you got to be careful about. You know, it's interesting you should say that. I've got a daughter who's entering the workforce and uh, she's working from home now, but uh, at the first opportunity, she's determined to get back into the office so that she can be part of those, uh, you know, those discussions around the water cooler or those quick meetings that happen instantaneously uh, at the boardroom. So, uh, yeah, I think that there, there's going to be uh, some division there, but I, I think that's the right way to go. We are going to take a break and we're going to come back with Thomas Caldwell after that. Please stay with us. And we're back here at Boom and Bust. I'm your host, as always, Tony Clement, uh, here with Thomas Caldwell. He is the chairman and CEO of Caldwell Securities. Tom, I'm again reading from headlines. Love to get your, your take on it because you're, you're right in the thick of things. Uh, lumber prices crashed, by seven, crashed 70% from their record highs. Uh, maybe this is going to this question of volatility and inflation and so forth. But, you know, that's what everybody was talking about. We talked about it on this show with you uh, a few months ago, but now they've, uh, they've been reduced by about 70%. So is that an indicator of anything, some return to sanity in terms of commodities? What's, what's your take on it? Uh, not necessarily. Within the pricing of any commodity, you have the real um, users, the people who use the product, the, the home builders, et cetera. So you have the industrial usage, and then you have the speculative trading community influence on the market. So they'll build positions, go long, go short. And, and that's supposed to even at the bumps. I think these days it's sort of adding to the bumps. You had a tremendous uh, building boom occurring in the States on the basis of low interest rates. And then of course our American cousins, even though lumber prices are going through the ceiling, immediately slap a duty on Canadian software lumber. Right. And that's been going on for, 15, Tony, since gosh, when you were uh, in Parliament, so yep. 15, 20 years. And uh, because our American cousins have this view that if you're beating them at a game, you must be cheating because being superior, you couldn't win unless you were cheating. <laughs> there's, a, there's a logic to this. So I think uh, our American cousins have cut off the border a little bit there. That demand has eased off south of the border. Uh, so it does leave us with inventories where the Canadian housing market is nowhere near as large. So there's these other components to it. Aside from the basic demand to build houses, there is the political influence either way that shuts off major buyers from Canadian lumber. And also you have the, the fact that we may have slowed down a little bit in Canada and done it. So it, the, the swings become amplified with uh, you know, the speculators over and above the commodity users. So I think it's more of that than a fundamental change that we're seeing. You may see a number of prices bounce back a little bit from this. So it's, it's more of a swing, in my opinion. Um, since you've raised it, and it's a very important point to raise, and we do uh, on this show with you, do come back to this issue because it's so important. But obviously, uh, the uh, Canada-US trade relations is just so important to this country. Uh, I guess I've got a series of questions on that. The first, the first one is, are you seeing a bounce back in the US economy? Yes, it's, it's picking up on a fairly wide scale wherever they've started to open. So it is going on fairly well. And there is inflationary pressures that is also pushing it. So the US economy is improving. I don't know what the rate is and they don't know what the, rate, what the real rate is. It's a bounce back right now. So we are seeing growth. And uh, how will that impact Canada and Canadians? Because the border is still closed, at least from the US point of view. Uh, we just, uh, as we record this broadcast, the U.S. announced uh, that uh, they're continuing for an extra month, the, the border closures at least. So uh, it's kind of hard to see some, sometimes how Canadians can, uh, can continue to grow the market in the U.S. I think Canada has a huge problem coming at it, and our, our politicians in Ottawa are not addressing it. Americans are protectionists, make no mistake about it. They talk about, oh, free, free trade and everything. Uh, that's as long as they're winning at it. They are protectionist. And number two, we have no, they have no special interest in us. 
and uh, we are no special friend of theirs. They see us as the enemy, just like anybody else when it comes to trade. So Canada, we have for a long time uh, lived off the fact that we are suppliers of raw materials, whether it be the US or to China, uh, energy, food, lumber, et cetera. Uh, when they don't need it, we've got a problem. We have lived off that far too long. We have lacked any coherent industrial policies or technology policies that to build the company in a, a country in a widening out of our uh, foreign exchange generation capabilities and employment capabilities. We've been lazy and our leaders have been lazy. And if you look at the Canadian dollar now down under 80 cents, it is purely a function of the price of oil. Canada is seen as a petrol currency. So if oil prices collapse, the Canadian dollar is collapsing with all that that entails. So remember, we're dealing with protectionists. Um, we haven't developed our economy and we've had 100 plus years to do it. We get involved in side issues that are not relevant to future generations prosperity. We're having this conversation with Thomas Caldwell of Caldwell Securities uh, about uh, the state of our economy and uh, now we're into Canada-US uh, trade relations as well. We're gonna continue the discussion with one last segment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, and our special guest today is Mr. Thomas Caldwell. He is chairman and CEO of Caldwell Securities. Tom, uh, before the break, we were talking about Canada-US uh, relations, and uh, you're, you wove into that kind of our, uh, our lack of ability to increase our productivity here in Canada, having an impact on the Canadian dollar, amongst other things, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, one editorial comment I'd love for you to comment on my comment is that, you know, a lot of people in Canada who were very critical of uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, you know, saw the election of Joe Biden as a, a new golden era of Canada-U.S. relations. But I, I will make the point that you made uh, last segment, U.S. is going to pursue its interests. And uh, that, uh, so far, has not yielded very much for Canada. Is that your observation as well? Absolutely. Uh, President Biden, uh, well, I wouldn't pick at him, but literally all our leaders, they don't lead, they follow. They follow by polls. They follow by local special interests. And, and America, as I said, is a protectionist country. Uh, our prime minister seems to feel that apologies and hugs are, are foreign policy. People will do business with you if they feel you have something to add to the mosaic. But wandering around as a child or as a charitable candidate doesn't cut it in the tough world we're living in today. And so we have to think about things. Canadians are very are smart, extremely well educated, have a great worldview. Every time I was shipped to New York with my the US firm that I worked with, I was stunned by the fact that they weren't even in our snack bracket uh, in terms of worldview or, or, or many, many other things. So we can compete, but in technology, we built some great companies particularly in the technology area, and they, they continually seem to blow up once management decide they should own hockey teams or something. So we really do have to have a, a, a policy. Artificial intelligence, one of the leading centers in the world for artificial intelligence is here in Toronto. But I don't think there's anybody in government who even recognizes that or sees how that might be nurtured. Um, and you know, the Kitchener-Waterloo corridor, we have tremendous talent in technology and also entrepreneurship. And we should be thinking those policies as opposed to, you know, apologetic, you know, whatever the polls are happening to be saying at a given point in time. This is going to cost future generations uh, because there aren't going to be the jobs. And so we have to be thinking of how can we build our country? And we need, we need a leader or leaders who can express a positive, enthusiastic, concrete vision on how to achieve it. And, and uh, I'm still looking for that on the, on the horizon. But we, we have to do something broader than just the playing patty cake type of politics that we'll be dealing in. Um, I guess this leads to my final question, uh, which is related to this, this conversation, and that is your assessment of how Canada is performing in the competition for talent. Well, Canada is a great, I think Canada is the greatest country in the world. And we have to keep reminding ourselves in that as opposed to taking days of reflection on July 1st. You know, this is a terrific country. People from all over the world come here and are amazed 
but uh, the, the politeness, the courtesy, the encouragement, the help uh, that, that we provide people coming to this country. I'm always positively disposed. I see you know, families from all over the world in Niagara Lake having picnics, and I feel so happy for them that they're in this country with this peace, et cetera. So we are winning the competition, but we've got to provide the jobs and the opportunities for these people. So this is a great place to be, and people are lining up to get in. The, you know, the weather's ratty here. Okay, I give you that. But other than that, this is a wonderful, wonderful. I've lived in many parts of the world, including the U.S., for a long period of time. And uh, I lived extremely well in New York, but I got to tell you, I was always happy to get back to Canada. And, and I think that's something you got to recognize. This is a great, great, great country. And we got to govern ourselves accordingly, as, as they say. Well, let's hope that uh, uh, present and future generations also uh, feel the same way that you and I do on that. Uh, Thomas Caldwell, it's been a great pleasure as always to have you on the program. I wish you every success as uh, chairman and CEO of Caldwell Securities. And uh, let's hope that uh, the uh, lockdown uh, restrictions continue to be lifted. Well, I hope so. All the best. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Thomas Caldwell for coming on the program. And really what I retain from that is that, uh, you know, we're coming out of lockdown and things are opening up, but we still have some fundamental challenges in this country, economic challenges, maybe political challenges as well. Uh, that if we want to have growth, if we want to have productivity, if we want to have uh, affordable prices, there's a lot of decisions that still have to be made. Thanks for watching.